Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our public forum on the killing of Qasem Soleimani, what's next for the Middle East. My name is Nader Hashemi. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies. And I really want to begin by wishing you all a happy new year, but I struggle to say those words given uh, the reason why you're all gathered here today. So let me um, instead uh, welcome all the students and faculty back to a new academic quarter. Uh, at the Corbell School, we have an incoming cohort of students that uh, begin in the winter quarter, so I wanna extend a especially warm, warm welcome to those students who are on campus for the first time. Uh, at the Corbell School, we study, teach, conduct research on uh, different aspects of uh, international relations. We focus on conflict resolution, human rights, international security, diplomacy. All of those things are highly relevant to the topic that brings us here today. Um, as you all know, we are, uh, it looks like we're headed to war in the Middle East. Uh, the assassination of the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani has quickly produced a series of events that has brought us to the brink of war. And as someone who spent most of my adult life uh, studying the Middle East, traveling to the region, writing and teaching about the region, uh, I've never been more worried than I am today about what seems to be on the horizon. Um, this seems very much like the lead up to the 2003 Iraq war, and we all know how that turned out. So uh, today we are going to have um, a public forum. The vision that we have is really a public forum uh, to talk about recent developments, what they mean for uh, this country, what they mean for the Middle East and the broader world. Uh, the format will be a conversation between myself and uh, Ambassador Gary Grapple. I'll introduce him in a moment. Uh, we will talk about uh, recent developments uh, for about half an hour, and then we'll turn it over to you for questions, comments, and um, commentary. But to just to, to, to get us started, to set the mood uh, for today's event, uh, there's a very good roughly six-minute um, Al Jazeera English clip that brings us all up to date on uh, how we got to this uh, moment of crisis over the last several weeks. So I'll ask Gina to play the clip and then we'll, we'll begin. Let's talk about the assassination. Qasem Soleimani was seen as the second most powerful man in Iran. He was killed in Iraq when the Americans blew up his convoy using a drone. This is the equivalent of the Iranians assassinating the U.S. Secretary of Defense. Iran is promising revenge. So who was Major General Qasem Soleimani? Why is there talk of a possible war between Iran and the U.S.? And was the attack even legal? I'm Sandra Gatman. Welcome to a special episode of Start Here. You only have to look at the size of Qasem Soleimani's funeral to appreciate just how important he was to people in Iran. Soleimani was the leader of Iran's powerful Quds Force. It's the paramilitary wing of the Revolutionary Guard Corps, and it's active mostly outside of Iran. The U.S. considers the force a terrorist organization. Now, what Iran has sought to do is uh, create some form of influence in the region. Now, they've managed to do that in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Iraq, and in Syria. And our good force has been credited with establishing that. He was credited with uh, fighting off ISIS and protecting Iran's borders. It was felt that if he had not made that intervention, then ISIS would have taken over large swathes of Iraq. The administrations of George W. Bush and Barack Obama both considered assassinating Soleimani. Both rejected the option as too risky. Trump, though, pulled the trigger. <laughs> Last Friday, Soleimani landed in Iraq at Baghdad airport. He was with an Iraqi paramilitary commander named Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis and other Iraqi officials. Circling somewhere high above them was a Reaper, a US military remote-controlled killer drone. It's unlikely they would have seen or heard it. To give you an idea of what these men were facing, here's video of a drone missile being tested. And here's some amateur footage from Baghdad that reportedly shows the actual missile strike on the convoy. 
they probably died instantly. Trump did not inform Congress about these plans to kill Soleimani in advance. This is very common for the Pentagon to present multiple military options to presidents in times of crisis. The Pentagon did not think, allegedly, that Trump was going to select that option, but that is exactly what he did. So why strike now? The Trump administration says there was an imminent threat. It's the only time an American president is allowed to order a military strike on another country without congressional approval. We took action last night to stop a war. We did not take action to start a war. Under US law, Trump had 48 hours to explain himself to Congress in writing. And he did in a classified letter. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says it raises more questions than answers. Democrats basically saying, what is the evidence that you have? What is that intelligence? And so far, the T Trump administration is not wanting to release that publicly. The assassination of Qasem Soleimani didn't just come out of nowhere. The US and Iran have been at each other for a while now, starting with Trump's decision in 2018 to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. That led to the reimposition of US sanctions designed to cripple Iran's economy, and Iran retaliated by resuming uranium enrichment. And ever since then, there's been trouble in the Gulf region. Iran was blamed for attacks on oil tankers. The Revolutionary Guard shot down a US surveillance drone. Then a Saudi oil refinery, the world's biggest, was hit by a drone strike. Houthi rebels in Yemen said they did it, but the US blames Iran. At the end of December, the Americans bombed targets in Iraq and Syria, killing 25 militia fighters linked to Iran. That led to people storming the US embassy in Baghdad, and now the Soleimani assassination. The fallout from the assassination has been immediate. The U.S. is urging Americans to leave Iraq immediately and is sending extra troops to the region in case of reprisal attacks. Iran announcing it has no limits to its nuclear activities. Now, ever since the attack, there's been speculation that Soleimani's death could lead to war between the U.S. and Iran. But most observers don't expect Iran will take that chance. You know, the Iranian side is very clear that their conventional military power is dwarfed by that of the US, Israel, and other regional allies of the US in the region. But Iran has proven itself to be incredibly sophisticated at asymmetric warfare, at cyber attacks. Right after Soleimani was killed, the Americans were talking about de-escalating the situation. Then Trump tweeted, basically warning Iran to forget about retaliating, because if they did, he's already chosen 52 targets, one for each American held during the Iran hostage crisis in 1979. There's a part of Iranian society that do not look up to Qasem Soleimani, that does not like the religious establishment. What Donald Trump has managed to do with the killing of Qasem Soleimani has managed to unite many parts of the country and political factions. President Donald Trump has also been accused of ordering the assassination to distract the American public from his impeachment proceedings. That was bound to happen. But whatever the motivation, Donald Trump's decision to kill Soleimani has people around the world feeling a little less safe. This story is moving fast, and there's a lot more context and history to Iranian and Iraqi relations with the US to get into. So have a look at aljazeera.com. It's got all the updates and lots of in-depth analysis as well. See you next week. Okay, before I um, introduce my colleague Gary Grappo, given the crisis that seems to be on the horizon, we will be organizing several more public forums, panel discussions, analysis such as this. We have a lot of talented faculty at the Corbell School and across campus. So you can follow uh, what we plan to do by going to our Facebook page or uh, adding your name to our email list, uh, which you can find uh, on our center's web, uh, our, our, on our center's web site, um, the Center for Middle East Studies. So it's an honor to have my colleague, Ambassador Gary Grappo, uh, with me today to help analyze and interpret this topic. Ambassador Grappo um, was the former United States Ambassador to Oman. Prior to becoming U.S. Ambassador, he was Charge d'Affaires and uh, Deputy Ch Chief Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Riyadh. He's also held important postings uh, on behalf of the U.S. government in Jerusalem and in Baghdad. Currently, he's a distinguished fellow at our Center for Middle East Studies, where he teaches two courses on U.S. foreign policy, 
in uh, the Middle East uh, this quarter and next quarter, and I'm hoping, Gary, that enrollment in your courses will go up as a result of uh, recent developments. Uh, so let me begin with a, just a general broad question for you. After the assassination of the Iranian general Soleimani, a prominent French foreign ministry official observed that we have all woken up to a much more dangerous world. Uh, is he right and to what extent is our world more dangerous today than it was prior to the assassination? Uh, it is more dangerous uh, simply because uh, the level of tensions between the United States and Iran have increased significantly. With the killing of Soleimani, we've, take, or we've taken that level of tension or conflict from, say, a two, maybe a three, to a level nine by going after um, uh, probably the second most senior person, even uh, 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 I would say outranking the president in terms of actual authority in the Islamic Republic. Uh, it, it's um, they, uh, someone here uh, in the film mentioned that he, uh, the equivalent of the um, Secretary of Defense, I'd say half the people in the United States don't know who our Secretary of Defense was. They may have known the prior one. Uh, everybody in Iran knows who that man was. Everyone in Syria, everyone in Lebanon, and everyone in Iraq. He almost occupied a mythical status. Not that it was necessarily deserving, but nevertheless, uh, he occupied a very unique position. And so the United States, by going after this individual, has dramatically escalated uh, the tensions between our two countries. And anyone who's familiar with the escalatory ladder in a conflict, once two sides who hold so much animus toward one another begin climbing that, even though they may talk about coming back down the ladder, the impulse is to go higher up, to respond. And certainly in the case of Iran, uh, we can expect there will be a response. They'll choose when and how. Uh, I, I will say uh, I think the Iranians will avoid a shooting contest with the United States. That's the one area where they know they uh, that the United States enjoys overwhelming advantage. They cannot win a shooting war with the United States. But they can't match our firepower nor our resources. They have a pretty decrepit Air Force, which really never recovered from 1979. They still fly airplanes that most museums in the United States now reject. Uh, but they do have a very effective rocket force, uh, which could wreak havoc on our allies extending out including um, uh, Israel. And um, uh, they have, of course, a very extensive network of proxies, which they can use to respond. So we have moved considerably up the escalatory ladder. Um, Senator Jim Rich from Idaho is currently the chairperson of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. After the assassination, he issued the following statement. Congratulations to President Trump on his decisive action and the successful outcome. Qasem Soleimani was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Americans, and his death presents an opportunity for Iraq to determine its own future, free from Iranian control. On behalf of every American serviceman and servicewoman who was either killed or injured due to an Iranian-provided IED or rocket in Iraq over the years, today justice was done. Soleimani was responsible for the weapons program that, that caused those casualties and injuries with the use of those treacherous and cowardly devices. Is Senator Jim Rich correct? Well, he's certainly correct in terms of Soleimani's responsibility for uh, the deaths of so many Americans in Iraq. When I served there, uh, I used to read a book this thick of intelligence reports on, counter on terrorism activity um, in and around uh, Iraq, and it was a rare occasion when I didn't see either his name or uh, the name of uh, Abu Mahdi al muhandis a.k.a. the engineer, who was the other uh, terrorist leader who was um, killed in that drone attack. Uh, there's no question. Both of these men would have fit uh, very easily 
into any criminal gang, organization, or drug cartel. They were ruthless. Uh, both of them will have a long accounting for the murder, misery, and mayhem that they inflicted on Iraq, on uh, Syria, on Lebanon, on Yemen, and other countries in this region. So no mourning on this side from, uh, on the death of those two. It was justice, but was it the right decision to make in the interests of the United States and our allies? And that's the real question. I mean, one of the arguments that we've heard recently is that President Bush and Obama had the opportunity to take out Soleimani, but they didn't do so precisely because it would lead to what we're facing right now. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, uh, because um, it, it would escalate the, uh, uh, the conflict to a level we couldn't predict. Uh, and in a situation like this, a confrontation, which you can't solve, you want to make sure you manage it, you contain it. And now we've sort of taken the lid off, and we basically have invited the Iranians to respond uh, in almost any way they wish, and they will. Um, it's sort of the ball is literally in their court, um, and they will do it. Uh, and we really can't predict where or how because they do have so many uh, avenues to come at us. Um, I, I want to make a point here that the threat isn't just in Iraq or in the Middle East. Our ally Israel, which to my knowledge was not given a heads up that this was going to happen. And, there, and you have to think that Israel is one of the targets for a retaliatory action uh, by the Iranians. To think that we would not warn a close ally like Israel in advance of what was to come um, is inconceivable. We didn't tell the Europeans either. The Europeans uh, are having to contend with a very extensive Hezbollah network in Europe. And Hezbollah, which is, of course, uh, a proxy organization of the Iranians, is more than capable of responding violently and effectively in Europe. And for those here who may not know, Hezbollah operates uh, cells here in this country. For the most part, they've concentrated in the uh, illicit narcotics trade in order to make money, but they, the switch can easily be flipped and they can become uh, violent as well. So we are exposed in our own country. If I were an American ambassador or a senior military officer anywhere, certainly in the Middle East, but even in Europe, I would be greatly concerned not only for my own personal safety, but for the safety of either my embassies or my military personnel. So in other words, Mike Pompeo is wrong when he says Americans are safer today because Soleimani is no longer alive. I, do, I, I have no basis for judging why he would make such a statement. We strengthened the hand of the hardliners, so on the political side, we've suffered. And on, uh, on the threat side, any planning that we may have been aware of, and I don't deny that Soleimani uh, was involved in this kind of planning, can continue. Uh, they have more than capable people. I don't think they'll be able to replicate the stature that he had, but these are very competent people, and they're going to be able to carry out operations uh, pretty much as effectively as Soleimani would have. In terms of key events in history, recent history, that have um, set us down this path toward war. Would you agree that the key event um, that shaped these um, series of recent events was Donald Trump's fateful decision in May 2018 to pull out of the Iran nuclear agreement? Well, yeah, because it just changed um, the whole dynamic uh, in the region and certainly between the United States and Iran. And it basically set up or reestablished uh, a confrontational situation in which there was uh, no basis for resolution. Uh, however faulty the, uh, the, the 2015 JCPOA, the Iran Nuclear Agreement, may have been, and it certainly did have its faults, it, it opened an opportunity for the two sides to begin to dialogue, to begin to discuss uh, other issues besides nuclear weapons. And despite uh, President Trump's 
uh, criticism of the nuclear and missile elements of it, it was a start. And our allies who were on that group that negotiated that agreement were prepared when the Trump administration moved in to work with us to raise the standards. We didn't have to withdraw. But that cer certainly set us down the course of confrontation, and it hasn't, of course, lightened up. Um, Gary, I'm, I'm very worried that Iraq is going to be the big casualty in this conflict. It's going to be the key battleground. I was quite optimistic that after the defeat of ISIS, uh, Iraq's future looked a lot brighter than its past in the sense that there was a major um, you know, defeat of this organization. Uh, there were elections that took place that brought people who were interested in public services and less ideological. And there was these really wonderful and optimistic post-sectarian uh, um, you know, protests that were taking place in Iraq that were demanding democratic accountability, reform. And now it seems that if this war moves forward, um, the fragile situation in Iraq is going to become completely untenable. And one of the big casualties in this coming conflict is going to be you know, the future of the state of Iraq itself. Do you, do you share my sense of foreboding? No, absolutely. I think if I were to, um, to um, rank, uh, at least in the week or so since uh, Soleimani was killed, um, the, uh, the effects of this, the negative effects or repercussions, it would be uh, the likelihood that we may have to withdraw from Iraq. I mean, this is a country in which we have invested blood and treasure since 2003, and is a pivotal, a, a pivotal nation, nation in our relationship in the Middle East. If the United States is forced to pack up all of our military personnel, it will be a strategic setback and defeat for the United States. And it will open the door for Iran to pretty much move in and have its way. Moreover, it would also open the door uh, for Russia to move in. And I have no doubt right now, by the way, today is Orthodox Christmas, and this is probably also a very nice gift for Vladimir Putin, because he's handed a major country in the Middle East uh, over to Putin if he wants it. And of course, the Iranians and the Russians do have, I'd say, a fairly good working relationship. Uh, and I have no doubt that Putin will try to take advantage of this if the United States is forced to withdraw. Uh, I, I will caution, however, that although the parliament voted for the U.S. to withdraw, they didn't set a timeline, uh, so they kind of left that open-ended. They also called for the withdrawal of all foreign forces, and that was kind of a throwaway because um, even if they did order the Iranians to leave, they're not leaving. Moreover, the, the Iranians have extraordinary influence in Iraq by virtue of the pro-Iranian militias uh, that operate uh, throughout the, uh, the country, as well as political parties. Mohandas, the Iraqi who was killed, headed up uh, uh, Hezbollah, uh, which is probably among the worst, although it's a, it's a rogues gallery when you look at some of these organizations. Um, so, uh, and, and the prime minister, Will, uh, would have to affirm the vote of uh, the uh, Council of Representatives. Uh, and uh, at the moment, Adel Abdel Mahdi is a caretaker, so it's not clear he has the authority. Um, but it points out the point that you were trying to make, uh, Nader, and that is, why did we carry out this attack in what is an allied country, Iraq? If we'd done it in Syria, or even in Lebanon, I think the fallout, particularly for the United States and our interests, would have been significantly less. But this is a very fragile country right now. Its economy is still on the ropes. It has not recovered from um, the Civil War and the American occupation. Uh, they've had, as you indicated, um, two or three months of very violent uh, demonstrations. The violence was caused by these pro-Iranian militias, um, and uh, they now don't have a very effective government with a caretaker prime minister. This is the wrong time and the wrong country to carry out the kind of attack that we did. One more question for you, and then I think you have a couple of questions for me, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. 
prospects for peace and de-escalation? Are we at the point of irreversible escalation? Is there any way of trying to dial this back in significant ways? As a diplomat, what are your thoughts? Oh, we certainly have uh, ways of addressing this uh, short of conflict. We have uh, still, despite the emasculation of the Department of State and our overall diplomatic capability, by this administration, we still have considerable capability. The question is, uh, will this administration, will this president use it? Um, and I fear that he won't. America has allies uh, to whom we could turn for assistance to reach out to the Iranians. And frankly, both the Russians and the Chinese, if this begins to escalate, have a genuine interest in not seeing this literally blowing up. Uh, particularly China, because it's so dependent on, on oil from this region. And, um, and I don't think we should hesitate to also call on them to try to turn, to, to turn down the temperature here. Uh, but unfortunately, um, with the, um, with the um, air attacks that the United States launched against the Qatab Hezbollah camps in Iraq and Syria following the killing of an American contractor and wounding, wounding of some of our soldiers, we further diminish the size of uh, our embassy in Baghdad. So our ability to reach out to decision makers in Iraq is, is, is further curtailed. Um, we have many avenues of approach. We have many levers that we can use. Um, the question is, would this administration be willing to do that? How about third parties? Um, is there a role here for the UN Secretary General for the French president who actually did try and bring about some sort of dialogue with Iran came pretty close, but was fundamentally unsuccessful. Can you see any possibility of some other actor in the international system who can communicate with both sides to try and bridge differences or at least prevent a, a, a major war? No, uh, 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 you, you, in, you indicated uh, French President Macron, um, um, the, uh, the Japanese prime minister as well has also uh, made several attempts to, to speak with the Iranians and was well received by the Iranians. So two very close allies of the United States can certainly help us, the Secretary General uh, potentially. But I think this would take an effort where the United States would sort of have to sort of stand back and work directly with these allies and others. And, and they would have to make the initial outreach to the Iranians to get them to uh, reconsider a retaliatory action. But of course, it goes both ways. And uh, if they were to try and make that approach to the Iranians, the first question that they're going to have to ask, or that they're going to have to answer from the Iranian side is, what are the Americans prepared to do? Now, we're not going to throw Mark Esper, our Secretary of Defense, on the railroad tracks here. but. Um, there, are there are clearly actions the United States can take as well to ratchet down tensions. Um, so this can be resolved diplomatically. It should be resolved diplomatically. Because if we go the confrontational route, like, as I said earlier, we cannot predict where this will end up. But it's not a good place. Um, you had a couple of questions for me? Yeah. Hit me with your best shot. OK. Um, uh, if you watch uh, the news media, uh, particularly in the last couple of days with the funeral processions in both Baghdad, which are not quite as animated as the ones in uh, Iran, but certainly the ones in Iran, we've seen this outpouring of emotion. Um, and uh, the question that occurred to me, OK, first of all, this is an authoritarian state. If it orders public employees to go out in the streets and demonstrate and even cry, they will. Um, but uh, perhaps even more importantly, in the case of Iran, um, uh, I've always uh, perceived this martyr culture. And Soleimani fits the bill as this great martyr now, one more great martyr in the cause. I wonder if you could just address that question. Yeah. Um no, it's a good question. Uh, how do you explain the, the size of the crowds that have been on the streets? To what extent um, is the Iranian regime manipulating you know, people to come out? To what extent is it authentic? Those are great questions. 
uh, I think what, what you're clearly seeing is uh, several things happening. Um, the Iranian uh, government, the Iranian revolution is 40 years old. It suffers from a deep crisis of legitimacy. A couple of months ago, there were nationwide protests, rocked the regime. It took place in 29 out of the 30 provinces. Uh, the regime had to kill roughly 500 people to suppress the protests. There's a young generation of Iranians that um, have been born and raised after the revolution. They aspire to uh, a more freer democratic society. Uh, the Islamic Republic faces a deep crisis of legitimacy for all of these reasons. They've openly stated it. Uh, so that's an important theme that shapes Iranian political culture, Iranian politics, but there's other themes that shape Iranian political culture and Iranian politics as well. The theme of anti-imperialism and the theme of nationalism. Anti-imperialism, uh, Iran has had a very troubled relationship with Western powers going back at least 200 years. It's had a very troubled relationship with the United States of America going back um, at least until 1953, uh, related to events that uh, toppled a popular prime minister and uh, the support that we gave to the Shah of Iran. Uh, this is deeply hardwired, in my view, in Iranian political culture. Uh, so that theme of anti-imperialism is still around, and it's been elevated, I would argue, under the uh, administration of Donald Trump with his sanctions, with his attempt to basically cripple the economy, bring the regime to its collapse, or if you know, John Bolton and his friend, friends have their way, bring about regime change. So you know, on top of um, you know, uh, that deep-rooted historical experience uh, in Iran, you have these recent developments that I think elevated the theme of anti-imperialism. You also have the theme of nationalism. Iranians have uh, a sense of nationalism. They viewed Qasem Soleimani, if you know his biography, as sort of a war hero in the Iran-Iraq war where he made a name for himself. And then he became this general who was largely responsible or is perceived within Iran as this heroic general who um, defeated ISIS. ISIS was a major threat. Now what's so tragic about these protests from my perspective is to see um, this man elevated as a national war hero when he has this other very ugly side to him that is not known in Iran, particularly what he has done in Syria where his fingerprints are all over the war crimes and the crimes against humanity that have sustained the Assad regime, particularly the siege on Aleppo, the starvation sieges. I mean, he, uh, a war crimes prosecutor, would have a, a very easy time, you know, charging him with war crimes for what he did. More recently in, in Iraq, as you sort of mentioned, these, these heroic pro-democracy protests, 500 people have been killed in the last two and a half months by militias that are directly connected to him. So he's got a lot of blood on his hands. Unfortunately, the Islamic Republic as an authoritarian system has prevented any public conversation or even debate about Iran's regional role. There was this, I mean, I, I can go into the history of this, but there was one very telling moment when in 2012, the Egyptian president at the time, Mohamed Morsi, goes to Iran because there was this non-aligned, non-alignment uh, you know, summit and he was taking over the head of the non-aligned movement and he's giving a speech um, and he talks about the regional chaos and the Arab Spring uprisings and he talks about the war in Syria. But when the Iranian official television was translating his speech, and when he was talking about the killing in Syria, they translate Syria and they replace it with Bahrain. They don't, they make it seem like he was talking about the uprising in Bahrain. Um, any Iranian politician or dissident who's tried to sort of raise questions about what Iran has been doing in Syria, suppressed, arrested, silenced. So um, he, within Iran, there are people who you know, have a sense of nationalism. There's a sense that he fought for Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. He defeated ISIS. And of course, you still have segments of society um, that support the regime, that are loyal to the regime, that are deeply religious. And the regime manipulates the theme of martyrdom um, related to the key event in Shia Islam, the death of the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, to elevate this person as this heroic figure who has been fighting the good fight in the name of you know, Shia Islam. Um, and any sort of dissent or criticism of his track record is prevented. And so you have this you know, um, rallying around the flag effect. But it's also, you know, it's a combination of nationalism. It's a combination of anti-imperialism. And what's happened effectively is Donald Trump has given a huge gift to Iranian hardliners and to the Islamic Republic, which was facing a deep crisis of legitimacy. Now they're actually celebrating 
because the theme of Iranian politics until recently and of Egyptian uh, and of Iraqi and Lebanese politics, the core theme that has been uh, the focus of attention in the region has been the theme of these anti-corruption uh, pro-democracy protests uh, that have challenged the regime and has specifically have challenged Iran's position in the region, um, both internally but also in Lebanon and in, that's all been forgotten or is quickly becoming forgotten. And the theme that is focused, uh, that, that is the focus of the world's attention right now and the region's attention is a theme that the, Ira the Iranian regime loves to talk about. Anti-imperialism, US foreign policy, see we told you so, they're saying. We don't need these divisive debates about human rights and democracy. We need national security because the historic enemy is coming to subjugate us. They've collapsed our economy. They're assassinating our war heroes. Um, um, uh, you know, and, and also they're using this as an opportunity to securitize society, to arrest more dissidents, to silence um, and, and repress much greater. So this is a, a colossal tragedy for the prospects of political change in Iran, in the region, and Donald Trump and his advisors, I think, have to take a huge uh, part of the responsibility and blame for this situation. Why don't you go ahead and just wanna... Yeah, let's, let's open the floor to the, the audience and... Um, uh, Gina, uh, our hardworking program manager. No, I think um, we've got one of our great students here um, to help us with the uh, with the uh, Q and A. So, if you raise your hands, I'll take three um, sort of hands as I see um, uh, Alan right here at, at the front, and then at the back. So, uh, one, two, three, and then um, then I'll go up the line uh, on both sides. And just uh, uh, a word of caution and. Um, uh, so that we can get to as many questions as possible, keep your comments and questions as precise and as uh, short as possible. Alan? Bad request to me, I'm afraid. Um, I really, I appreciate uh, both of your thoughtfulness and I learned a lot from this, but as a former leader of the anti-Iraq war movement, I don't believe the United States in the Middle East is a diplomatic force. I believe that it is an aggressor. I think we invaded the country of Iraq, and a lot of people who fought us, and a lot of people who fought the invasion here from below, weren't at all anti-American, thank you. They were anti-aggression. Now, Chris Murphy made this really beautiful point. He said, what if they took out our Secretary of Defense with a missile? Abstract from the names, international law bars the wanton killing of officials of another regime, and it goes into killing diplomats, and previously it had barred torture through our efforts, and under W, and under this administration, this has been fundamentally undermined. And that's why a lot of people just can't stand this. Now, we have a press which in the main, like uh, Elizabeth Warren was on Fox News, and there were a bunch of military lobbyists on CNN and MSNBC who didn't admit that they were military people, one of whom is uh, Jay Johnson, whom I have some respect for, who was in the Obama administration, is now an executive of Lockheed. And he talked as if he wasn't an executive of Lockheed, and he gave his opinion as if he wasn't. And the Trump administration tweeted out his tweet saying that the assassination was legal. So I just want to say, everybody who gets out in the street to fight this is doing a very good thing, which will save us if anything does, because this is very frightening. The second thing I want to say is there are exactly two candidates, Sanders and Warren, who have spoken out very, very, very forcefully about the truth of this. And there are several candidates, including Mr. Biden and Mr. Buttigieg, who refuse to recognize exactly the point I'm raising, and I throw it back at you. Why should anybody who dislikes the Iranian regime and sympathizes with the young people, and even who's very sympathetic to Obama trying to further that, nonetheless not feel like American militarism has created this situation mainly. You want to comment on that? You don't have to. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to comment on any of the political candidates. I, I just not appropriate for. I mean, we all have our opinions. So, uh, but in terms of American uh, militarism, 
Um, I, I kind of understand uh, the term. When I worked for the US government, I was uh, somewhat repelled by it. But on the other hand, I certainly recognize, and uh, this didn't begin uh, under the Trump administration. Uh, it probably began much, much sooner, including going as far back as, um, as George H.W. Bush, and that is the militarization of, of uh, U.S. foreign policy, where um, very often, uh, in, uh, almost instinctively, um, our presidents, our leadership, turn to uh, the military as opposed to uh, our diplomatic uh, capability to address tough problems around the world. Um, and sort of as a corollary to this, um, if not the military, well then we'll slap sanctions. And even uh, President Trump is now talking about slapping sanctions on, uh, on Iraq, which is supposed to be an, an ally of the United States, and the last thing they could afford was U.S. sanctions, although it's questionable what kind of impact um, uh, the sanctions would have there, given the state of that economy. Um, but certainly the militarization of U.S. foreign policy is, is a concern of mine, and I have many, many, many military colleagues, including those still serving in uniform, who are bothered by that. That uh, almost the knee-jerk reaction, uh, certainly of this administration, but of previous administrations, is, um, is to turn to the Secretary of Defense, or the J Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and say, how do we respond to that? And not to the Secretary of State, and granted there's not much of a difference these days with the current Secretary of State, um, but to our, our diplomatic forces and say, let's sit down and carefully consider how we can resolve this uh, through diplomacy. And no country in the world is more capable of addressing problems, whether bilateral problems or global problems, diplomatically than the United States, simply because we have all the tools and the power at our disposal. Nate, we've got two women here at the front who have questions, and then we'll go up the go up the line. Yeah, go ahead, right, right there. Yeah. Thanks. First off, thanks for giving us this opportunity to hear what you have to say, Ambassador. My question is this: Given what I understand is the decimation of the diplomatic corps as well as the State Department in general, and Trump's historical efforts, uh, his, his history is proving that he is an unreliable partner in the world, given his uh, extraction to various treaties. How is it that the diplomatic corps can still maintain its power in negotiating with other allies as well as the various Arab communities? Well, it's a very good question because, uh, as I said, it. It first starts with the commander-in-chief. Uh, if we have a commander-in-chief, i.e. the president, who is committed to it, then our diplomacy is empowered. We can get things done. There are very competent and capable people who know how to do it. We have friends and allies around the world who look to us and are prepared to work with us. And throughout my nearly 27 years uh, in the Foreign Service, I saw this on countless occasions. But it starts with the Commander-in-Chief. If the Commander-in-Chief stands behind this, you can get it done. If he doesn't, then they might as well stay home. And uh, tragically, that's almost where we are today. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Foreign Service has effectively been reduced to a reporting organization. And now that's something we do extremely well because we know lots of people, we speak the languages in all the countries where we serve, and we can talk to a lot of people, and we, we write very informative pieces which are easily digested by those in leadership uh, positions, easily understandable, uh, either in a tweet or not in a tweet. Um, uh, but that's, for the most part, all we're doing. Um, and that's only a minor part of what we can do. And, but I'm afraid that's where we are right now without the power of the president standing behind any genuine diplomatic effort. Next question right here. Uh, 
Um, good morning. My name is Dania. I'm from Lebanon. So I'm happy to hear Lebanon being mentioned anti-corruption. So my question goes about the um, foreign policy of President Trump toward the Middle East. So President Trump was clear in the beginning of his term that I'm no longer interested in involving the Middle East. So on September, we had the attack on one of the major allies for United States without any, on like Saudi Arabia, without any major attack from United States on for Saudi Arabia, any retaliatory attack. And now we're seeing a completely different movement and answer for that with Soleimani attack. So I don't understand um, if you can help me in understanding like the system of alliance the president is going forward and the system of involvement in the Middle East. So um, is he interested to which extent and on which like parts of, of the Middle East, especially that it was clear for him that we're no longer interested in involving in Syrian civil war. So he pulled out all the American troops from the Syrian civil war. And then when it comes to Yemen, he didn't mention anything saying that I'm no longer interested in Yemen. So this is major two sides in the Middle East that United States is no longer involved. But then when it comes to the Iraq war, it's considered a big mistake for the American administration. Similar to the Vietnam war, we're seeing another attempt for involvement, which, which make it very unclear to watch what is the policy of the president. So this is question number one. And question number two, it's about the Iranian economy. So right now, the Iranian economy is facing a huge economic problems when it comes to foreign currency, sanctions, and employment rates. To which extent do you think this will make it hard on the, on the Iranians' uh, leaders, decision makers, to decide into going into war or not, taking into consideration all the consequences of a war and the financial problems that it has on the country? Thank Just you. a point of order, one question per person. Uh, so take the first one, and if we have time, we'll get back to the second one. Um, I think we're all familiar with the concept of quicksand. The more you try to get out of it, the deeper you sink. Uh, welcome to the Middle East. Uh, and I think the president is, um, I don't know whether he's learning, but he'll find out uh, that uh, uh, the more uh, churn that you have, the more problems that you create, and it's certainly in the case of this most recent escalation in our conflict with Iran, it is most definitely the case. Now, if we are expelled, if our forces are expelled from Iraq, um, I'm not sure how this president will react to that. Uh, because I don't think he has um, any understanding whatsoever of the Middle East or the critical role that the United States plays in the Middle East. Uh, it will have a very destabilizing effect on Iraq and on the region because we will have empowered Iran and more than likely Russia as well. Uh, and that's not good for the Middle East and it's certainly not good for the United States. Uh, we have com he has compounded American problems in the Middle East, regardless of what happens in, in Iraq by taking this action. Um, I'm not saying it's going to lead to all-out World War III. That's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. Or even um, a toe-to-toe -to -toe blows with Iran, because I think the Iranians are smart enough to avoid that kind of a catastrophe for themselves. Uh, but uh, tensions are going to increase. The conflict will escalate. And we can't predict where it's going to go. Um, one of the other immediate uh, spin-offs from uh, of this attack is that the Iranians announced that uh, they are not going to abide by any of the restrictions on uranium enrichment, uh, enrichment um, which means not immediately, but at some point down the road, they will again be capable of producing nuclear weapons. I don't know whether they will or not, but they will certainly have the capability because despite the JCPOA and what that did, it didn't completely eliminate the possibility and if Iran now says that it's going to uh, begin enriching uranium again to the level that could potentially uh, produce a bomb, then we have an entirely different uh, Middle East. And then we could be talking about the kind of war that some people fear. Nate, could you start walking up the stairs? I want to take three questions sort of the back of the room. One at the very end, yeah, the, the gentleman standing up. And we have two more opportunities for someone to raise their hand. One, two, okay, go ahead. You've mentioned how the Japanese, the Chinese, European powers don't want this thing to blow up. Can you tell us about what forces within the region 
wanted to blow up. <laughs> who, who, who's, who, where is this coming? What are their groups like? What reports do they have? Um, I don't know anybody even in the Middle East. In fact, um, some of the reports uh, that, that I've uh, have seen uh, indicate that the Saudis were certainly no friends of the Iranians and the Emiratis, who um, um, are very, oh, both of them very close allies of the United States, have uh, begun very quiet outreach to Iran, stating very clearly they don't want to be drawn in the crossfire between Iran and the United States. Um, and quite honestly, this would not be a good thing for Israel as, as well. The Israelis certainly don't like the Iranian leadership for understandable reasons, uh, but if you start um, escalating this conflict, as I said, uh, Israel has to be considered a primary target of some of these proxy forces, most particularly Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, which has uh, missiles capable of reaching any place in Israel. And undoubtedly, they will go after population centers, uh, Haifa, Tel Aviv, Ashkelon, and others. So uh, I can't even, I don't know, maybe North Korea uh, might, might want to see this, but uh, no, I don't know anyone who wants to see this get out of hand. And by the way, I, I, I will also comment that as this escalates and the U.S. has to commit more resources to address that conflict, we still have to worry about North Korea, China, Russia, Venezuela, and what's happening uh, in, in Eastern Europe with Russian encroachment. Um, so how do we balance those interests, which are far more strategic to the United States, even potentially existential, uh, versus what we're going to have to wrestle with in Iran? Next question, um, Nate, yeah. could you raise your hand so Nate can sort of see you? There you go. I think we were all taken by surprise by the Saudi refinery attack in September, both by the accuracy of the missiles, the number that got through, the inability to, uh, to strike them down before they arrived, and even for a week, not to even know where they came from. Are the, technical, are the technical capabilities of Iran in terms of ballistic non-nuclear missiles a blind spot for us? Well, they were certainly a blind spot for the, uh, for the Saudis. Um, um, I, I think we were uh, fairly much aware of the sophistication of um, the technology that the Iranians possess. Um, I, I think what, what caught folks off guard uh, was the inability of the Saudis to detect it, uh, even with some of the um, military uh, defense equipment that they've purchased from the United States and from Europe. Uh, but don't forget, the ranges are very short, so the detection time is minimal. Mm -hmm. And so even with the very best technology, uh, it would be extremely difficult. Uh, the only comparison I can make is, is, is um, the, uh, the Iron Dome system that Israel employs, which is extremely effective, but not 100%, because we're, we're talking about very short ranges, and you really can't detect these things until they're considerably above the ground, and that leaves you very little time to react. Could you hand the microphone to the yeah, person right in front of you? Thank you. Uh, hi. The Kurds in northern Iraq have enjoyed relative peace relative prosperity and autonomy uh, over the past 15 years. What will, uh, w will there be any impact of the, the recent events on their situation? Well, I would agree with your statement about the relative stability, peace, and prosperity in Kurdistan up until about four or five years ago when ISIS began to move in, um, and then things changed. Uh, moreover, um, they had this foolish, ill-advised uh, independence referendum, which everyone, including the United States, warned them against doing. And as a result, they have suffered considerably, and they really are not in the position uh, that they once were, certainly when I was there 2009 and 10. Um, um, the, the one saving grace for the United States, if we have to withdraw our troops, uh, from Iraq is the Kurds may say, I don't know, come on here. 
we have autonomy and we're making this decision and we want the Americans here. And it wouldn't take much arm twisting on the part of the United States to be able to persuade the Kurds to allow us to maintain some kind of a troop presence in Iraq, but in Kurdistan, which of course is quite close to Iran, and so it's not gonna make the Iranians that happy. Uh, that's probably our, um, our fallback. The one problem with that, actually, I don't know if anyone heard NPR this morning where Steve Inskeep was being was interviewing the former Iraqi um, foreign minister, Hosham Zabari, and this actually, he kept pressing him to say, look, if, 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 if the Iraqi government votes to expel American troops, can't they just go to Kurdistan? You, I mean, you're a Kurd, wouldn't you just? And he didn't want to sort of say yes, and he didn't want to say no, because were he to say yes, effectively that means the relationship between the Kurds and the central government would break apart. Uh, although he sort of tried to indicate that yes, they would be welcome here. Uh, so it puts the Kurds in a very difficult situation. I don't think they could accept um, the presence of American troops um, as, and then still remain within a sovereign Iraq. It would simply f tear at the very fabric. Um, so they're in a very difficult situation. But I think more broadly to your question, another war in the Middle East, um, uh, destabilizing the region, creating refugee flows, creates political vacuums and opportunities for ISIS to resurge, and that poses a direct threat to the Kurds. Um, and then of course, you know, depending on how a future war will look like, you know, um, all minority ethnic and religious groups are gonna be very vulnerable um, in that context. So I don't see how the Kurds in any way benefit from this state of affairs. I think the only way that Kurds uh, get a, um, a better shot at life, a better future, is to try and strengthen the democratic components and aspects of the countries that they live in, hoping to get proper representation, proper voice, a proper say in the national affairs of their country. In many ways, Iraq is a lot further ahead of the game because there is, for all of its problems, at least elections, representation, and the Kurds have been able to, I mean, right now, Iraq has a, a very competent um, you know, um, president who happens to be Kurdish and who has actually played a really important role recently in trying to navigate the demands of the protesters with the demands of the parliamentarians, bridging that divide between the ruling political parties and demands of people on the street. Uh, so those are my thoughts about the, you know, the status of the Kurds. We have time for, I think, maybe three more questions and we'll have to wrap it up. One, two, and then three. Um. My question, so we've talked a lot about the possibilities of diplomacy moving forward, but I want to move towards more of like a worst case scenario. If it does lead to uh, an attack from the US mm -hmm. inside Iran and leads to a larger conflict, um, where, what sort of scale do you see it moving towards, like potentially an invasion of Iran, or and if so, what role do you think Russia and China would then play? Would would they come to the aid or support of Iran in if the conflict escalated? Land invasion, absolutely not. The U.S. military, I, I think, would dig in their heels. When we invaded Iraq, the population of Iraq was about a fourth of what the current population is of Iran. There are major, major cities that we could not simply, and when we couldn't control them in Iraq, we less capable of controlling them in Iran. So it's just out of the question. Nevertheless, we could, we could destroy through our air and naval power a, well, almost the entire industrial base. We could destroy their naval forces and their air forces. Um, but I mean, Iran's just not gonna sit there and take the punch. Uh, they have, as I said before, they have very effective rocket forces, uh, and you can be sure that if we launch attacks inside Iran, that they're going to employ them. That's the one uh, punch that they have, and they'll use it, not to mention these proxy forces that, that uh, both Nader and I have, have mentioned repeatedly uh, before. China and Russia, not sticking their hands in that wood chipper, no way. Uh, particularly the Chinese, they have too much at stake with the United States. That's why uh, I tried to argue before that uh, their natural impulse here, particularly China, is to find a way to, um, to bring down the temperature here. Uh, they'll probably stand on the sidelines, try to bring 
any conflict to some kind of an agreeable solution. But introdu uh, introducing their own forces, especially China, is too far from home. Russia doesn't have the projection power. Uh, I mean, they'd be happy to sell weapons since they'll sell weapons to anyone. Um, sometimes we're like that too. Um, but um, uh, so it, it would be a very lopsided open war, which is precisely why the Iranians are not going to go down that road. Yeah, I'll just add very quickly, I mean, your question is a hypothetical, so it's difficult to answer with any precision or accuracy. But it's important to listen to some of the advisors that have a lot of influence on White House Iran policy. Many of them come from um, some of these, you know, neoconservative right-wing pro-Israel organizations. One that's quite prominent is known as the FDD, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy. I think that's a misnomer. I think they're more of a foundation for the defense of dictatorship in the Middle East and the Likud Party in Israel. But, but if you listen to what they have to say about Iran, they deeply believe that if you simply, you know, shake the regime a bit, maybe bomb it um, from the air, it will uh, produce a domestic uprising and a revolution. And that's what Trump, Trump's advisors, that's what, that's what John Bolton clearly believed. And they've surrounded themselves with some of these very, um, I think, discredited, non-representative Iranian expats who tell them what they want to hear. You know, you would think that the recent uh, response to Soleimani's assassination in Iran would perhaps be a little bit of a wake-up call, that that wouldn't work. But we're talking about some really deep ideological people who live in their own bubble. And I th they have the president's ear. And so if ever it gets to a point where the president wants to you know, bomb Iran, I suspect they would you know, encourage him in that direction. We're not talking about troops. I think there's no support anywhere in this country for a troop uh, deployment into Iran. But that type of scenario of bombing Iran from the air, hoping that that will, you know, that will produce some sort of domestic uprising is very much, I think, part of the debate in the White House right now. And of course, it's completely distracted from reality, because if that were to happen, it would have the exact opposite effect. I just comment that uh, the University of Maryland did a very interesting poll of how Americans view our conflict with uh, ir Iran. Um, overall, Americans between 75 and 80% are opposed to war with Iran. Uh, even among Republicans, the opposition to war with Iran is two-thirds. So you have a very strong element in our country that does not want to go to war in the Middle East, especially against Iran. Question at the top. You, ha you have the microphone? Yeah. Second to last question. Go ahead. Thank you, gentlemen. My name is Byron Tialios. I'm a fourth year undergrad. Um, what are your thoughts about the, the actions taken by the executive branch, and what would you have done differently if we find out in the coming weeks that there was, in fact, an imminent threat uh, targeting U.S. personnel led and orchestrated by Qasem Soleimani with the direct purpose of targeting U.S. personnel? That has existed before we took him out, and it still exists today. Nothing has really changed except he's out of the picture. Uh, the, the, the sort of charisma that he lent to the Quds Force, uh, that's gone. But in terms of the capabilities of the Quds Force to carry out whatever they were planning before is still very much present. Anyone remember spring 1943? what the United States did, we shot down the aircraft uh, carrying uh, the, uh, the architect for the attack on Pearl Harbor, Admiral Yamamoto. The war against Japan lasted another two and a half years. It had literally no impact on Japan's capability to wage that war. I'm not necessarily comparing Imperial Japan and their capabilities in, in uh, World War II to, uh, to Iran, but the capabilities of the Quds Force, the IRGC, and Iran in general has not been diminished effectively one iota. They just kind of lost their main guy. But there are lots of other competent leaders. Your question is an interesting one because it seems to suggest that perhaps there was some justification in Trump's decision. All the evidence we have right now is that there was no imminent threat. It was razor thin. Even if, hypothetically, down the road, we discover that there was a significant threat to American personnel, you have to ask and evaluate, well, what are the second, third, fourth order consequences for taking out uh, someone like Soleimani 
for American policy and America's you know, position in the region. None of that was considered by Donald Trump. It was all made up at the last moment. Um, and this is how he does policy. He's very impulsive. Uh, you know, there was a question at the beginning that sort of suggested, well, how do we explain what seems to be this bipolar disorder that Donald Trump has? You know, just a couple of months ago, he was saying, we don't need to be in this region, we're pulling out, these are forever wars, bring our troops home, and now it's the exact opposite. He's sending troops to the region and he's talking about, you know, bombing 52 sites in Iran. So, you know, it's pretty clear that, you know, one of the things that Donald Trump lacks is any foresight planning or discussion of consequences. And I think we're seeing this playing itself out right now. So that's why um, I think that even if there was a threat, um, it would still require a lot of pause and reconsideration because you have to consider the consequences. They would have to happen, well, the day after. In fact, it should have happened a couple of days before the decision was made to go after Soleimani. This is what you wanted to do. The first thing, and we've done these kinds of things in the past where we have had to take a military action. We start deploying our senior diplomats to our closest allies around the world. We also usually, uh, that person is usually uh, accompanied by uh, someone from the Defense Department and from the CIA to provide our allies with pretty much the same information that we had in making the decision that motivated us to take this action. We certainly should have informed Israel since they were a likely immediate target, um, but the Europeans as well. Uh, and that's how you start your movement toward uh, hopefully trying to achieve a diplomatic solution. But uh, as far as I can tell today, there is no diplomatic effort. I have spoken with um, uh, some folks on the East Coast, uh, but they're from outside the government, and they're looking at taking action. They're talking with governments, talking to people whom they know inside friendly governments of the United States, and in some cases even talking to the Iranians or those who are close to the Iranians and saying, we need to start talking right now, immediately, about how to lower the temperature in this conflict before it gets out of hand. But there's no sign of that happening, uh, at least insofar as I can tell, um, from our government, which is um, very discouraging. Last question here at the front. Where's the uh, microphone? Actually, I'll give, I'll give her mine. I'll play Phil Donahue for people who remember that show. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. I wanted to... Uh, Go ahead. I wanted to segue... Dr. Hashemi, from what you were talking about, specific to third, fourth, second, third, and fourth um, order consequences. We're sitting here hypothesizing from this 30,000 aerial view of the international implications, and yet, I'm kind of dating myself, I'm already seeing the manifestations in this country at the Canadian border of implications that were played out during the Bush administration. We've got Iranian uh, citizens that are US citizens that are being detained at the border and subject to strict scrutiny to re-enter. Uh, we've got a humanitarian crisis globally regarding refugees. We've got a manufactured crisis on our border from this administration. And so I'm asking, my, I guess my question is, for the graduate students in the audience who are taking courses with both of you, what can civil society right now do to engage? Because we've got implications in this country. Um, lots of actions. I mean, the gentleman here talked about uh, maybe working with one of the political parties, um, and, and that's certainly an option, but um, uh, some international uh, organizations with which I'm familiar um, have um, all sorts of efforts underway, not just in this specific issue with regards to uh, Iran, but many other contentious uh, issues around the world uh, to conduct mediation, to conduct track two, Track two is where you actually bring in government officials unofficially to speak unofficially on behalf of their governments, but can actually exchange points of view, and you can hear the truth from them rather than sometimes the propagandized versions that you get from government spokesmen. Um, so, um, uh, and then just being active publicly uh, with uh, all the many organizations, and we're fortunate and blessed in our country that we have literally thousands 
of, uh, of non-government organizations that are active across the board on all these issues that are um, important to us. Um, I, I wanted to make one final point here, and this goes back to um, 19, or, yes, 1979, and the, uh, the crisis the United States faced with uh, Iran with the Islamic Revolution, and then, of course, into 1980. Uh, Jimmy Carter suffered severely as a result of that crisis, and many believe lost the election uh, because of what, uh, what happened during that, that crisis. And one of, the, one of the reasons was that uh, um, Khomeini, who was the Supreme Leader at the time, uh, refused to release the U.S. hostages uh, during the presidency of Jimmy Carter. I started thinking, well, Khamenei was around at that time. He wasn't the Supreme Leader. Um, I'm sure he can take certain actions that would be harmful to the prospects of Mr. Trump in this election. I don't think Mr. Trump reads much of uh, political history of the United States, but that would be a pretty valuable lesson, that you don't want to undertake actions uh, that would lead to circumstances you can't control. And right now, I'm sure Khamenei uh, has all of his uh, American um, uh, issues advisors sort of pouring over all the vulnerabilities of Mr. Trump, wondering, OK, how can we go after this guy? Um, and I don't know whether uh, 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 Nader and others have mentioned the second, third order consequences. Well, this is a consequence that, that directly and personally affects Donald Trump. And I don't even think, and he usually thinks about himself first. He should have thought about himself first before he took this action. I would just add as a final comment that your, your question is very good because um, I'm hoping that your question will overlap with the crisis that brings us all here today. Um, we have an election in this country in about 11 months. I think it's the most important election, not only in the history of this country, but the history of the world. One of the things that dawned upon me moving from Canada to the United States is how important decisions are that are made in this country and the effects they have around the world. And that puts a unique, I think, moral burden on every person who has American citizenship. Because depending on how you vote and who you support, it could um, make a huge difference in terms of whether people live or don't live and what the future of our planet is. So hopefully, you know, this crisis will inspire people not just to vote for president, but we have two senators, you know. Important decisions are made. If we have the right people in, in the Senate, it can make a difference. We have some sway over that. Um, but you know, it's not just important that we vote, but you've got to take 10 people with you to vote. I and mean, 50% of the people in this country don't vote. Um, and we also have voter suppression, so that's a big problem. But I'm hoping that um, you know, people will use this moment of crisis to get involved in the political process. Um, the reality is, if you're looking at the polls, Donald Trump has a good chance of getting reelected. If you don't think it's not going to happen, you're not reading the same news that I am. So um, uh, thank you for all for coming. There's going to be, unfortunately, many more meetings to talk about this subject because it doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon. But this is what we do at our Center for Middle East Studies. This is what we do at the Corbell School. And we thank you for your support.